Few foods offer the bang for buck provided by a simple and effective pot roast. It is a monarch's meal, but it's cheap, it's easy, the only thing you need is time, largely unattended. I think my version offers particularly deep and complex flavors thanks to strategic removal of the lid. Though you will need something lidded, a big Dutch oven, burner on medium, and preheat the oven to 350 Fahrenheit. Here's our roast, a giant thick steak of chuck, that's beef shoulder. That's the classic choice. Two and a half to three pounds, I'd say. It's tough enough that it has lots of collagen that'll melt when slow cooked and go unctuous. It also has close to the perfect amount of fat for braising, although if you want to limit the amount of melted fat in your finished gravy, I think it's easier to remove some of it at this stage. Chuck roasts usually have a big concentrated nut of fat right there in the middle, and you can just get in there and cut it out. Our finished sauce is going to be so viscous that it would be hard to skim off this fat at the end of cooking. Don't worry about mangling the meat. We're going to tear it into chunks in the end anyway. And don't worry, there'll still be plenty of fat. This just takes the edge off, as it were. Tiny amount of oil in the pan, just enough to get the meat started. It'll melt out its own fat real quick, and in the meat goes. I don't think there's any point in seasoning it. It's going to be totally covered in sauce at the end. Lots of recipes tell you to brown meat for braises on high heat, and I have generally concluded that's bad advice. Unless the pan is really crowded with a ton of meat that's going to suck up a lot of heat, your finished product is going to be way better if you take it easy, medium heat. Any burned flavors we create on the bottom of that pan will absolutely spoil our sauce later. The meat will brown on medium, just give it time, during which you can cut up a big onion. I often like to do thin quarter circles for thick stews and such because those little strands kind of act like structural mesh in the finished gravy. They hold everything together. When you can peel the meat off the surface without it sticking too hard, it's ready to flip. Oh, and if you've got a stick of celery around, that's nice to put in. I have to get the pieces really small to hide them from Lauren. She doesn't like celery. If any part of the exposed surface of the pan looks like it's going to burn, I'll just move the meat to cover that part, thus diverting some of that heat. Bottom of that meat could still do with a little more browning, but I'm worried about my fond burning, so out this comes. I don't care if it sticks and tears a little bit, we're going to tear it into chunks in the end. Onion and celery go in, just to give that a little head start. I don't think you need to cook them until they're soft or anything. They're going to cook for hours with the meat. Basically, again, when I'm worried about the fond burning, I'll throw in a big squeeze of tomato paste and maybe a quarter cup of flour, at most. Stir that all around to get the flour granules dispersed in the fat, lest they lump up, and also to let the tomato paste brown a little bit. Browned tomato paste adds incredible depth and intensity to stews and sauces, even things that you don't want to taste particularly tomato-y at the end. Again, when I'm terrified things are about to burn, in goes a couple of cups of red wine, up to half a bottle. You could use stock instead. Start scraping the bottom with a wooden spoon. I absolutely do braise beef and white wine sometimes, but I think the combination of red wine and tomato just can't be beat. And in goes a quality 28-ounce can of crushed tomatoes. Again, scrape that bottom clean. I know this just looks like tomato sauce at this point, but it won't by the end, I promise. That said, if you don't like your pot roast tomato-y, you absolutely could use less tomato or none. Just use beef stock. I'll do a big glug of Worcestershire sauce. That'll give it a really meaty flavor. You could skip it. You could use soy sauce. A lot of garlic powder. This is what garlic powder is perfect for. When it rehydrates in the sauce, it just brings tons of umami. I prefer it to fresh garlic here, and of course it's far more convenient. A little pepper, or not. Save it to the end if you want. In goes that floppy mess of meat and whatever juice came out of it. Just give this a little schmush to get the meat coated. I know the liquid looks way too thick, but a ton of water is going to come out of that meat. Lid goes on, and in the oven it goes at 350 or like 180 Celsius. And while I'm down here, I'll throw in some potatoes. Maybe five russets or big Yukon golds. Maybe a mixture of the two. Just let that all cook until you can easily pierce the potatoes with a fork. In the meantime, let's go outside and get some rosemary off the bush. Rosemary just makes food taste cozy to me, probably because it's the main fresh herb I use in the cold months. This is, after all, an evergreen. Oh, hey, it's my dumb car. So I went to the car store and they were like, ooh, what kind of car do you want? And I was like, I don't care, dude, just as long as it goes. Just give me some anonymous car. And boy, howdy, did they do just that. I think I've tripped over this thing in the parking lot because it was so anonymous looking. Like many people my age and younger, I'm not super into car ownership. I've always viewed it as kind of a necessary evil, but it might not be so necessary anymore thanks to the sponsor of this video, Turo, the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform. There's no waiting at rental counters. You just borrow a car from a normal person just like 
like you whenever and wherever you need it. Here, you go on the website or on this app and you can see what cars are available around you. And you can save $15 on your first trip using my link in the description. This is not just a major city thing. There's a bunch of Turo cars right here in Macon, Georgia, also in more than 5,500 other cities in the US, Canada, the UK, and Germany. They even offer delivery if you need it. And you can get whatever kind of car you need, more than 850 makes and models. You can get anonymous, purely practical cars like mine, or ones that are not that. Get $15 off your first trip with Turo by using my code RAGUSIA15. That and the link are down in the description. Thanks to Turo for sponsoring this video. Now let's go back inside and check on those potatoes. After about an hour and a half, they are soft. Out they come. Let's check on the meat while we're down here. Alrighty, when I stick a fork in this, it's really soft in some spots, less in others. Chuck is kind of a variable piece of meat. You could cook yours less than I do, but I really like this cook to the melt in your mouth stage. So back in it goes for another hour or so. Just let those potatoes cool for a minute. Let's think about carrots. I like for my pot roast to be virtually equal parts beef and carrots. So I'll peel a pound of carrots. I try to find big ones for this. And I really want evenly cooked al dente carrots, which requires cutting them into pieces of roughly equal mass, despite the widely varying girth across the length of the carrot. So long pieces down near the tip, progressively shorter pieces as we move to the stem end. And remember, they'll shrink, so cut them bigger than you want them. We'll just put those aside until we're ready for them. Potatoes. We're going to make mashed baked potatoes, which have incredible flavor. Get a cutting board, a big pan, some butter. I'm using this whole, like, 7-ounce package. That's almost two sticks. You could use less or more. Put that on medium heat and get it melting while I peel and chop like half a head of garlic. Any butter will do. This is a French butter made with cultures. That is to say it's fermented with a little bit of bacteria. Love that zing in mash. In the garlic goes, and as soon as I get it stirred in, I will turn off the heat and just let that cook gently. If you see or smell anything turning dark brown, take it off the heat, but it should be fine where it is. Now I'm going to take one of these things, a ricer. Cut the first potato in half, it's cool enough to handle now. Scoop the flesh out with a spoon, put it in the ricer, and then extrude directly into the butter. Ooh, look at that. For mashed baked potatoes, I think a ricer gets you the best, smoothest texture. Whipping doesn't really work, the flesh is too stiff. You can get a really nice kind of rustic texture by just crushing up the flesh with a fork if you want to go that route, but honestly, I would push things through a ricer purely for fun. All right, just to start with, a big pinch of salt, big glug of milk, and a bunch of pepper. Then stir all this together. Kind of up to you how much or how hard you want to stir it. You can homogenize the texture a bit with aggressive stirring at this stage, or not. I can already tell that I'll want more milk. I know people say you have to get the milk hot first. I've tried it both ways, and I cannot tell the difference. And scalding the milk would require dirtying another dish. Give it a taste and add more seasoning or more milk or anything that you want. Don't expect these to be as smooth as boiled mashed potatoes. They won't be. If that's a problem for you, boil your potatoes instead, which I often do. But the higher temperature the potatoes get in the oven gives these a much more intense, kind of caramelized flavor. Remember, boiling water can get no hotter than 212. Fahrenheit. No browned flavors happen at heat that low. I'll just cover those up and leave them on the warm setting until we eat. All right, pot roast has been in for two and a half hours total now. Meat is really tender. I could pull it apart with a fork. I think you want it basically done before the final stage where we brown the top and cook the carrots. In they go. Just get them wet in the sauce, but I'm actually not trying to get them submerged. I want them to get some dry heat. I think an absolute game changer for pot roast is to cook it uncovered for like the last hour. That sauce might seem too thick already, like it's going to dry out and burn, but the carrots are going to release a lot of water into that pot so it'll all even out. And don't worry if there's some stuff around the rim that looks like it's going to burn, that's fine. Let it burn, as long as it means we can brown our top. While we're waiting, we can pick our rosemary off the stems and chop it up a bit. Like an hour later, the carrots are just tender enough to pierce with a fork. Going to be an awesome al dente contrast with the jello soft meat. So that roast had three and a half or four hours cooking total. And yes, the upper rim is burned, but who cares? Look at the brown top on that meat. That flavor and texture is insane. All right, last minute flavorings go in. Pinch of salt to start with. The only salt in there so far is from the Worcestershire sauce. And I love to finish long stewed things with a shot of vinegar. That's balsamic, but anything would be fine. It just wakes 
breaks things up. Long cooked flavors are delicious, but a little dull. Some fresh pepper and in goes the rosemary. Add it at the end and it will stay green. Now I want a pulled texture for the finished product. You'd normally take a couple of forks and pull it apart like pork butt for barbecue. But like I said, that meat is soft as jello under there and we're gonna beat it up a bunch while we stir in our last minute flavorings. So I say stir first, then pull. You can see it already falling apart just from the stirring. If we over agitate this, it's gonna shred into cat food and I am avoiding those burned edges. I don't wanna dissolve those into my sauce. Give it one last taste for seasoning, needs a pinch more salt, and then there's really only a few big chunks of meat that still need to be pulled apart into bite-sized pieces. That's it, let's eat. Big pile of mash goes on the plate. That is the perfect medium for soaking up extra sauce. Then on goes the meat. I know that people put multiple kinds of vegetables in their pot roast. Sometimes they cook their potatoes in the pot roast, but if you just keep it to one main vegetable, you can make sure that it gets the perfect amount of cooking time. You do multiple vegetables at once, then at least some of them are probably gonna be really mushy. That meat is just covered in melted collagen and fat. It is lip smacking. And this neither looks nor tastes like tomato sauce. The long, partially dry cooking has transformed this into something much darker and sweeter. There's enough still in the pot to serve an army and it reheats great, incomparable bang for buck. Speaking of which, remember to save $15 on your first car trip with Turo by using my link and code in the description, and may your winter be made warmer with this.